الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I always like to begin by thanking if it's an early morning lecture for thanking those who show up I, I'd like to believe these are the serious people the ones who show up early everyone else wakes up at 11 and then they come whenever so Jazakum Allah khairan for coming for being here I want to tell you about um, an incident I had some 12 years ago or so. I was overseas and I was uh, praying Tarawih in this masjid. And in the middle, in the break in Tarawih, this sheikh would give these talks. And talks were phenomenal, like insanely good. The knowledge was superb. And I knew of that person as a popular scholar. And we also have the same mentor. I have the same mentor as that scholar, even though there's a big age difference between us, age gap. Anyways, so w just I was attending, and I didn't want any attention or didn't anything f want anything from anybody. But just one day, I said, "Let me introduce myself to him," and I went to introduce myself to him, and and then I remember just driving back after that night and just saying to myself, "Why? Why did you go up to him? What? Why did you just pray and go back home? Why did you have to go and introduce yourself?" Because it was so insulting. Like he was just marginalizing me, had no, just trying to walk out, no interest whatsoever. Now cut to this uh, actor, some of you may know, by the name of John Travolta. And John Travolta, they say that if you're waiting on him at a restaurant, and he comes in with his directors and all kinds of people, and, and when, you're, when they're in that large table, all the focus and attention is on him. Right? Because he's the star and everybody wants to hear from him and his stories. But they say what he does is he gives the waiter or the waitress all the attention. So he asks, what's your name? What do you, what do, you do? Do you study? How do you like it? How would you get into that field? How much do you have left? How do you find juggling work and, you know, and school and how difficult is it? And every time the waiter or waitress comes with something, he asks them more questions about themselves and he shows so much interest in people. And it's a shame that uh, a scholar who knows the Prophet Sallallahu would marginalize people so much, whereas this actor knows how to make people feel special. And of course, not everybody is like that. I'll tell you about the first time I met uh, Mufti Mink. Mufti Mink is a, a close friend of mine. And the first time I met him, it was at a conference in Hong Kong. And He's the star, right? So everybody's waiting for him. I gave my lecture, another sheikh friend of mine gave his lecture, but everybody's waiting for the real star to show up, and that's Mufti Mink. And, ev and we were getting updates that Mufti Mink's plane has landed. You know, Between lectures, Mufti Mink is on his way from the airport. Takbir. So everyone's expecting and waiting for him. And then he walks into the, the hall room. It's packed. Everybody's already there. And he walks in. And all the cameras are on him, and the flashing, and the, everybody wants, you know, get some baraka, rub off from some, <laughs> some from his stove or whatever. And with all the spotlight on him, he turns all the spotlight to me. And he's like, Sheikh Kamal, it's so nice to finally meet you. I love your jokes. I listen to your lectures. My wife is a huge fan. My wife threatened me to not come home unless I get a selfie with you. And while all the attention is on him, he pulls his phone out. And, and I had like prepared a little thing to tell him you know, how much I appreciate what he does. I didn't get a chance to say anything. He just kept hitting me with things. And he took his selfie right then and there. The, the room is huge, and it's packed with people. And he takes a selfie right then and there. And then he gets up, he gives his lecture. And then we go back to the speaker's room. And the cameras and everything is on him. And he's directing all the attention to me. How are you, Sheikh Kamal? It's so nice to meet you. The selfie we took wasn't good. Let's take another one. And he takes another one. And it's like, can you look at that? And that's why I, I love the man a lot. And we're good friends because of his excellent manners. And if you want to know, how is it that the number one Muslim speaker in the English language is a man from Zimbabwe? And most people don't even know where that is on the map. So how did someone from that place get to be the number one? And I, was, I wrote a thing about him. And I said, basically, Mufti Mink is just an innocent child with knowledge and a robe, just pure-hearted. And that's what works, and that's what wins people over. 
So at the end of the day, it all comes to how you, you deal with people, how you treat them. And that's how people evaluate you anyways. Yesterday I spoke a lot, mentioned a number of a hadith about the importance of good manners in Islam and the place of good manners. But that's how it is. Akhlaq means, in Arabic, it means how you treat people. So you either have good akhlaq or bad akhlaq, but you cannot have no akhlaq. You understand? And this is a common mistake. Like Arabs will say, ma indu akhlaq. He doesn't have akhlaq. What they really mean is he doesn't have good manners. But everybody has manners. It's how you deal with people. It's either going to be good or bad. And it's how people evaluate you. They don't care about anything else. If I introduce you to someone who's a rich millionaire, and then he looks at you in a condescending way, sees something insulting about what you're wearing and the comments on your shoes, and then walks away. Would you love that person? Why not? He has millions of dollars. Why wouldn't you? Of course, it doesn't matter to you what amount of money he has. It's all about how they treated you. What if I introduce you to someone who prays the night and he fasts every single day? And then again, he says something rude and condescending to you, looks you up and down, and then walks away. Would you love him? Why not? He worships Allah all night. You don't care about that. It has nothing to do with me. You worship Allah, good for you. I want to see how you treat me. And how you treat people, that is the mark or that will determine your success no matter what area you're in. No matter what area you're in. One of the interesting studies, they looked into doctors who get sued a lot and doctors who don't get sued a lot. Why do you need to study that? It's simple. Doctors who get sued a lot, they make a lot of mistakes. And doctors who don't get sued a lot, they don't make a lot of mistakes. Simple. But then the study found they make the same number of mistakes. The exact same number. It's not like these were dumber. Same number of mistakes. But why did these get sued? It came down to their akhlaq, meaning how they deal with their patients. I'm sure everyone in the room must have at some point in their life encountered a doctor who just, it's like an assembly line. They don't have any time for you. They come in real quickly, okay? Every, huh? All right, and they want to move on. They're trying to make money, all right? <laughs> trying to pay off med school bills. All right, Muhammad, pay attention now. <laughs> so, like, they just, it, you're just an assembly line. They don't care about you whatsoever. And, and I remember a doctor that treated me for something. It was just basically a ganglion cyst. His name was Dr. Kittridge, I'll never forget. Because he was just a joke. He was a loser comes in, he walks fast, he doesn't look you in the eye. He just wants to schedule the, the, the surgery. He wants to just cut things out, throw them away. He wants to get paid by the insurance company. And he walked out. If Dr. Kittredge messed anything up, I would sue him. Actually, I wouldn't. I'm not white. But the point is, I'm kidding. Relax, everybody. <laughs> but if you would have messed up, I would be angry with him because look at this guy. He just treats you like nothing. But if he was a good doctor, we became kind of friends, you know, I'd let it go. Mistakes happen, and it's all that. So it's, at the end of the day, whatever field you're going to be in, you're gonna, it's going to have to deal with good manners. I was giving this talk two weeks ago to some high school kids, and, and I was saying, Tell me, show me one career path where you don't have to treat people well. You can be selfish and abrasive and rude. And they thought there was such a thing. You know, fighter, MMA fighter, boxer. Really? You can talk to the promoters like that. You can talk to your trainer like that, your whole camp that way. No, you can't. There isn't a field. Oh, garbage man. You don't have good manners to be a garbage man. Really? So when you go to the manager, the pe person in charge, and he hands you your check and you insult him, you think you're going to continue working there? doesn't matter. No matter what field, it's all in the end. It's all about how you deal with people. And what's beautiful in Islam, there are three areas of akhlaq. Number one, your akhlaq with Allah. That's your conduct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's your dealing with Allah azza wa jal. So you have akhlaq with Allah azza wa jal. You have akhlaq and your dealings with other people. And you have akhlaq with yourself. This is the part that we don't get to talk about much. This is the, your akhlaq with yourself. Your self-respect. You know, that's why, you know, those of you who speak Arabic, when someone misbehaves, you tell them, nafsak. Respect yourself. Because the way you're behaving is not befitting and you should be ashamed of yourself, not just in, in, in afraid, ashamed in front of people. And that's why when the scholars talk about haya, feeling shy, modest, bashful, they talk about haya in front of Allah, in front of people, and in front of yourself. And so self-respect is a huge part of it. Okay. 
This is all tying into emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is basically, as you can tell, it deals with emotions. It deals with how you handle, how you understand, how you use, and how you manage emotions. And there are a lot of things dealing with that. First of all, there are a lot of good books on that. I'm going to suggest a few, or maybe just suggest one. But they talk about what they call uh, self-awareness. Like the first step for me to be able to treat people well, I have to understand myself. I have to understand myself, and I have to be aware of how I come off to people. That's very important. So, the f so are you aware, I'm asking you now, are you aware of how you greet people? Do you know what it looks like when someone greets you? What are they seeing? Are you aware? Or do you think it's just a pleasant experience? Have you ever smiled and greeted in, in the mirror to see what other people see? It's not crazy. Uh, how many people actually don't smile and they have no idea that they don't smile when they greet people? All right? If you want to see if I'm right or wrong, just for the duration of this day, this conference, notice how many times when you greet people, notice how many times they smile and how many times they just say nice things to you. Good to see you. Type, tell your face. And it's good to see me, but your face doesn't say that. <laughs> it should show here. Be aware. How many times have you greeted someone and you just kind of like this because you're in the middle of something and you just went like this, huh? like that. Or maybe just real quickly like that. But look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he greeted people. They described وَإِذَا سَلَّمَ كَانَ إِذَا سَلَّمَ بِكُلِّيَّتِهِ Like he used his whole body to greet you. So he didn't just give you his hand like this. He didn't just turn his face towards you. But he turned his whole body to you and grabbed your hand with both hands and never removed his hand until you pulled your hand away. Not in a Trump sort of way. But in a <laughs> very reasonable, not like, he's a fantastic person. He's a fan <laughs> you know, it's reasonable. Um, so many people don't smile. Be aware of that. I've got to tell you my Sweden story. I was in Sweden, and they said there, uh, you know, the, I don't know if it was a conference. I don't remember what it was, but it was, there was a, a free day. So they said, okay, they're going to show, they're going to take me out and show me, you know, the historic town or whatever. So they brought this brother. He was very knowledgeable in the history and of the city and the, the buildings, and he was showing me things. But he was a grown man, and he was doing something to me the entire day. Every time he wanted to get my attention, he smacked me right here with the back of his hand to get my attention. So every time he wanted to show me something, tsh, tsh, uh, and if you look at that building tsh, over there, tsh, all day he's slapping me silly, and I'm getting raw over here. Now I want to show him that that's not acceptable. You're a grown man. You can't be smacking another grown man and not even aware that you're doing that. So I said, I'm going to show him indirectly that what he's doing is not acceptable. So instead of just moving away like this, some people, they don't notice things. So if I just make a subtle movement like that, he won't notice it. So I said, I'm going to make a huge, grand movement so that he catches it. So every time he came to smack me, I went like this. Big gestures, open arms, just so he'd pay attention. You know what he did? He just leaned over further. <laughs> That's it. And he continued smacking me the rest of the day. It's an example of someone who's completely unaware of how they come off to others. So step number one, be aware of how you're coming off to other people. Do I smile or not? Do I stare people at, at people too much? It makes people uncomfortable. And there's some people who are completely not aware. They stare at you hard, and they're just quiet staring. That's because they're not aware of how they come off, or they get real close. And even when you move back, they just be aware of that. Be aware of how you come off. There are many examples of these things. You know, uh, a lot of times also in Q, sisters, be aware of that. Sometimes when it's Q&A time. Sister will come up to you with a question, and it's sometimes a private question, so she doesn't want others to hear. So she gets real close, kid. So you move, she gets close again. And you, you're back against the wall. I had a rule in my class where you have to stand, we have to find an object, object, and you have to be on the other side. I had something called the chair. 
And I would put the chair and like you stand on that side of the chair and you talk to me. It doesn't even look right when we're like this. And a lot of times sisters would come around the chair. And now we're doing musical chairs and go chasing me around and said, just stay on that side. I have a trick. I'm just sharing this with the brothers. So if a sister gets too close, like outside, there's no chair, no tree, nothing to put between you. So this is what I do. I put one foot way out, then I lean back like this. So now this creates a good distance. Like there's no way she's going to get close unless she Michael Jackson's over. <laughs> Anyways. But that's not the way. The point really is being aware of how you come off. All right? Being aware of how you treat people. Do you smile? Do you stare? Do you say things that sound condescending? Do you interrupt people? Many people think interrupting is an art form. I'm waiting for the right moment for you to, to, help, to, to catch your breath for the next sentence, and boom, I cut you off, and I think I'm smiling. You know one of the amazing things? The Prophet never, ever, ever interrupted people. And it's not easy because you want to talk. But he never interrupted people. Remember the narration where, in this narration, it was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, and he came, and he's in, really saying very insulting things. And you have to remember, he's speaking to the last messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And imagine, imagine someone said this to you at your MSA da'wah table. Oh, I see you every Tuesday here at the table. You know, are, is it, um, why are you doing this? You're trying to make some money? I'll give you some money. Here's five dollars. How would you feel? Are you, you doing this to get girls? I, I can introduce you to some girls. Anna, you t I'm going to jump over this table in a minute. And this man is telling this, saying this to the Prophet ﷺ. If it's leadership you want, sawadnaka alayna. We make you our leader. If it's women you want, we will wed you to the most beautiful women. The Prophet ﷺ is quiet this whole time. And then when he's done, afaraght ya Abu walid Are you done? Now listen to me. And he started to recite Quran to him. Until he became Muslim, actually. Then he left again. But the point is that, look at these manners here. Not interrupting. Do you have to, if you interrupt people, you need to be aware of it. But maybe you won't know. How are you going to know? And that's why advice is so important. So when we come to understand ourselves, we need the help of other people. Because sometimes, I'm not aware of something that I do because I view it, I view it subjectively and they view it objectively. One time this guy is giving me a ride to my, to my car. This is at the university. He's like, give me advice. I love people to give me advice. I love to improve myself. Give me advice. I said, okay, Taib, I don't know you that well, but I will not hold back. If there's anything constructive I can tell you, I'm not the kind that will hold back. Inshallah, I'll tell you. Two seconds later, did you think of anything? I want to just tell you. I don't know you, man. Just hold on a second, all right? And then a minute and a half later, Give me some advice. Then I remembered something for real. I remember that he always interrupts people. I said, you know what? I did notice something. I, I, do, I do know one thing I've been wanting to tell you for a while. You interrupt people a lot. He said, yes, yes, I know that. Give me another one. <laughs> this is a true story. Type. And then I said, that's not acceptable. Yeah. And I wasn't reprimanding him or being rude or anything. I said, that's not acceptable. Yeah. And if you already know it, fix it. You, you, would you collect advice from people? That's a hobby of yours? Or do you gather so you can do something about it? And that's what I'm talking about. Self-awareness, they call it. And every, you know, there are many different, they're, no, they're not etched in stone, the steps to becoming emotionally intelligent. But you find a lot of them mentioned first being aware of yourself and how you come off to others. Because that's going to affect their reaction. The way you are is going to affect how they are. There's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. You've probably read it. And in the introduction, he says, read this book. Keep this book because you're probably going to read it more than once. And I remember when I first read that. Thank you so much. Jeff. Okay. I thought, man, that's kind of a, it's kind of a little bit arrogant of an, of a, an author to say this. Like, you're going to read this book again, so don't lose it. But I ended up reading it again. And I remember I was angry, and not angry, Annie, but I was, every time I got to a chapter, I was like, subhanAllah. And that book was written in the 1940s. Every time I get to a chapter, and he's using a technique, or showing a technique, I'm like, man, and Nabi Sallallahu used this technique in the Battle of Tabuk. Next chapter, Prophet used this on the day of this. 
on Dev al Aqaba or on Dev of that. Like, we had the techniques 1,400 years before this author. We should have been the ones to say, here's how to win friends and influence people. But unfortunately, we're behind in analyzing the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. So then they develop a field called emotional intelligence. Suddenly the Muslims, we're good at saying, ah. So they develop the field where, ah, Prophet used this technique before. Like, why didn't you say it so everyone else could say, ah. Anyways. So, and, and you'll find most books on the topic will either, most authors will either refer to that book by name or they will refer to a story in that book or they're in one way or another indebted to that book. So it is re, it, like the bread and butter when it comes to that topic. And I would recommend people to read, to read that book and to notice how the Prophet ﷺ used many of the techniques that are mentioned there. Okay. Um, so one part we said self-awareness, others they said self-management and you know managing your own emotions and the Prophet وسلم, yeah, tons and tons of ahadith telling you to manage your emotions, to control your anger, to, uh, that from his manners that he doesn't interrupt people and all these are things that are going to determine how someone else because there's a, a basic norm in, in human communication it, they call it re reciprocity. We reciprocate. So if I start yelling, even if you're having a great day, if I come and start screaming at your face, you will start to scream back immediately. Or if you come to my house, I open the door, and you're like, Assalamu alaikum. And I'm like, Wa alaikum assalam. Very nice to see you. Come on, fatal, fatal. What are you going to say? Immediately, nice to see you. And you're going to start whispering immediately. You reciprocate. You don't even know what we're whispering about, but you reciprocate immediately. If I speak to you in a condescending manner with attitude, you're going to give me attitude immediately. So they said, a psychologist said, why would you allow a stranger so much control over you? You had a great morning. You prayed Fajr. You made your adhkar, recited some Quran, had steak and eggs. doesn't get better than that. And then you get in your car bright and early. You're, you're ahead of time. You're comfortable. Then you meet someone who woke up on the wrong side of the bed, doesn't know what Fajr is, didn't have any coffee or breakfast, and he's late, and he's rushing, and then you encounter that person on the road, and he honks at you. He's also proficient in sign language and French. And suddenly, you allow him control over your day. You lose your cool. You show what you learned from sign language as well. A little bit of French you took in high school. And then you come to work fuming and you tell everyone else about what this guy did to you. He cut you off. Why? He was having a bad morning. How is that your problem? So they said people will reciprocate. However, whatever attitude you give them, they give it back to you. So they said if that's the case, then why don't I use that to my advantage? So for example, if someone is angry, how do you calm them down? Number one, it's not going to be through saying calm down, right? That's the thing that makes people angriest when you're angry and someone says, calm down, sir. Or the police officer says, calm down. Don't say that. It's a waste of time. So they say one of the best ways, you just keep speaking in a very calm, relaxed way. And they'll reciprocate. In negotiation, they teach you this technique. You're going in and you don't have the upper hand. The other party has all the advantage and all the upper hand. And so they're speaking to you in a condescending way. So, so why should I sell to you? What do I need you for? What do I need to hire your firm? And so what happens is you start, to, even though you need them, you start to get arrogant too. So they teach you, ignore, like as if you don't see their attitude. And just keep a friendly attitude. Actually, we actually did this in an exercise. We had the disadvantage and the other party had the advantage. And the guy was super cocky and arrogant. Like, well, why should I sell to you? I don't need you. You're a small company. You're a startup, this, this, and that. And we were like just being super friendly. I told my partner, be super friendly. Don't, ever, don't let their attitude affect you. And then guess what? Within a minute or two, they were super friendly. And they were acting buddy-buddy, and they forgot that they were the arrogant one and all that because people reciprocate. And people will naturally start to, like, copy each other. We, it's called 
uh, limbic synchrony. Synchrony. It sounds fancy, limbic from limbs, synchrony, you'll start to synchronize. So they notice that if two people are talking for a while, then they start to subconsciously uh, match each other. The way they stand, their voice will match. They start to use the same loudness, same tones, and then the same rate of speed of talking. So they said, if that's going to happen anyways, then why don't I force that to happen? subconsciously for, for the other person. So they, so, and, and it does work, okay? So if two people are talking and after a while one of them does this, the other subconsciously will do the same thing. If he does this, the other one after a while will do it. So they said, okay, what if I start by matching your movements, and then here's what the crazy part. I start matching your movements for a couple of minutes, and then when I start making a movement, without feeling, without knowing, you will start matching and synchronizing with my movements. Now, look at this story. This lady said, uh, she was a, um, a radio host, and she's interviewing this author, and you know, you have to read their book first. And, and it, it's an actually a, a very excellent book. It's called, uh, there, the, he has two books. It's called, uh, his name is Nick, or Nicholas Boothman. All right, and I promise this is the last time I promote anything British. Okay, he's British. And he has a book called Convince Them in 90 Seconds and Get Them to Like You in 90 Seconds. Two short books, very nicely written, easy to, to implement. So he says he's flying to New York to do an interview with this lady about his book on the radio. And the lady read his book, but she tested it. She's, she tells him this story. She says, I read the chapter on limbic synchrony. And I went with my husband, went to a restaurant. And there was a lady, an old lady that I've never seen before, and she was almost diagonally across from me like this. So she said, for the next 20 minutes, I would subtly, just in a subtle manner, imitate whatever movement she made. If she leaned forward, I would lean forward. If she leans back, I would lean back. But it wasn't, you don't do it like a mirror, like, like that, just very casually. They lean forward, you wait a little bit, then you lean forward. She said, after 20 minutes, the lady got up, and I've never seen her before in my life. She got up, and she came over to me, and she said, excuse me, I feel like I know you. Have we met before? These things are real. These things, are, these things work. But you know what it is? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of us with the ability to, rem to understand and intuit emotions. But most of us have it on, off, or very low. But all of us have that ability. And all you have to do and this is something I talk about in the da'wah class. All you have to do is bring it up a notch or two. That's all you have to do. Everyone has it already. You have the system. You just bring it up. Turn it up. That's why if you ever watch something on television in another language, you, and you can understand what's going on. Why? Because now that you don't have language to use, what do you do? You bring it up a notch and you start paying attention to voice inflections, to facial expressions, to body language. And now you can start to figure out what's going on because you don't have the language anymore. You need to focus more. Oh, I get what's going on. I think Roberto really messed up. Dude. That's why, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever you're watching, you can figure it out now. So all we have to do is learn just to bring it up a notch, start to pay a little extra close attention. Women in general are better than men at this. Women are better at intuiting emotions and, and figuring out what people are feeling and from reading their facial expression, they're better than that than brothers, than, than men are. <laughs> One lady told me, she said, I would get mad at my husband. And then she said, I would even get more mad at him for not noticing that I'm mad. And that's how they are, like, that's how men are. We just sit there, wife is angry all day, you don't even know. And then you say something to her, and then she gives you this angry no. And you're like, wait a minute, are you mad? Like, yes. I thought you'd just give me the day off. I, I had no idea. That <laughs> I see some brothers nodding their heads. But that's just because we don't put effort. It's not that we don't have the ability. Don't listen to this nonsense, oh, men are not good at it. No, just put effort. Be good at it, you know? All right. You know, the Prophet ﷺ made everybody feel important, and it's not easy at all. We have a nice community in Houston, Texas. We have three imams. I'm one of the imams there, and I'm always reminded of how hard it is to be a good leader, always. 
because at the Battle of Tabuk, the Nabi وسلم, mentioned 1,400 companions by name. He asked about every single person. Did so because it was hard to leave. There was a lot of pressure to stay back. So, so people who came out were heroes. So did so and so join us? Did so and so leave? Did so and so come with us? He asked about everybody, which is really amazing. Just a few weeks ago, there was one of the uncles in the community. He was like, I was gone for weeks. You never asked about me. You know, I'm just busy. I'm running around. There's so much stuff to do. I didn't even notice he was gone. And at that moment, I remembered the greatness of the Prophet ﷺ. What a great leader. How much time do we have left? Every time you look at your watch, you get nervous. Ten minutes? Seventeen? I got ten over here. I'll meet you halfway. So being able to make everybody feel important is a big deal. Remember that narration, we all know it, of Amr ibn al-As, the Prophet ﷺ sent him at the head of an expedition. And then when he came back, he said that every time the Prophet ﷺ saw me, he smiled so much. To the point that he began to think he's the favorite of the Prophet. In his mind, look, I'm sure he loves me more than anybody else because he did a great job on the expedition. And every time he sees him, smiles so much. So he dared to ask him. And we know this hadith, but focus on some points. Prophet said, Amr ibn Asr, which of the people are most beloved to you? And the Prophet very quickly, and this is one of his generals, right? He said, Aisha. Now, look at that answer. We all know this narration, but did you ever focus on that? Like one of his generals comes and says, who's your favorite person? You know, if somebody asked you that, like, you know, someone came and said, who's your favorite person? You'd be like, oh, you know, Sheikh so-and-so. And you just try to make it manly, oh, this Sheikh or, or this person. And, but nobody says, oh, my wife. is like, you feel ashamed, right? Don't. Here's the Prophet ﷺ, so honest. He said, Aisha. So he wants, to, he wants the category that he can fit in. He said, no, no, من الرجال, yeah, from the men. He says, our father. So said, okay, maybe I'll come next. Who else then? He said, Umar. Who else? Uthman. And I kept asking, who else? Who else? And then I, he says, I stopped asking him out of fear that he would never bring up my name. The treatment made him feel he was number one. But the other thing to look at here, look at the honesty of the Prophet ﷺ. Look at that honesty. That he didn't bring him up on the list just to make him feel better. He's just very honest. He's just going through the list like that. And you asked me and I'm giving you the answer. You know? Like, <laughs> like if, you know, Yasser or one of the organizers here, Yasser, Rami, one of the, okay, like, who is your favor of all the volunteers during this conference? I'm like, well, Muhammad, because he's been driving around, me, you know, around town and stuff, and brought me dinner. And then he's like, okay, but who's next? And out of embarrassment, even though I like Rami more than Yasser, I'll be like, oh, you, Yasser. <laughs> all right, don't tell him that. I'm just making that up, all right? But look at the honesty there of the Prophet. But that was not my real point. That was just a side point. The, the point was the Prophet made everybody feel special and made everybody feel important. And that's what a noble person does, okay? When... <clears throat> And try this in your life. When you're at a dinner, and every, everybody loves to talk about themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody loves themselves. There's, we're not mentioning it as a bad point. If you don't love yourself, you have a problem, see a therapist. So it's good to love yourself, all right? And when we're at a dinner, and everyone's talking about, you know, what, the, what coffee they like, and what coffee does to them, and caffeine does this. Caffeine keeps me up. Caffeine has no effect on me. Everybody wants to share about themselves, right? Oh, pollen does this. If you can be at a gathering like that, stay quiet. Don't share anything. And just allow people to talk about themselves. And they'll have a greater time because they don't really want to hear about you. <laughs> they don't. There's a story that is cited. It's in How to Win Friends and, and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And this story is cited by, in many other books. He was at one dinner where they randomly placed people next to each other. And then he says, this lady next to me just kept talking about herself the whole time. Didn't allow me to say a word about myself. Just kept talking about herself, and he's just showing interest. And then he says, at the end of the dinner, she says, she tells him, you are a wonderful conversationist. He said, I didn't say anything. But she thought it was wonderful. Why? 
because he allowed her to speak about herself. So this lady says she went to, uh, to a business dinner, which was slash an interview with two people. She said, the first one made me feel like he was the smartest person in the world. All he talked about was himself, his achievements, how smart he is, what he has done, and all that. She said, the second one made me feel like I was the smartest person in the world. That's, that's what a noble person does. That's what you should do with people. Let them talk about themselves. Let them feel special. Make them feel special. Show interest in what they're doing without being nosy. Okay? Without being Arab. Uh, <coughs> nosy. <laughs> Come on now. You know Arabs push it. Min fin, where do you work? How many siblings? I just met you two seconds ago. Stay out of this. You're writing a book? <laughs> Anyways, but the point is that Make people feel special. Let them talk about themselves and then show interest. And they will remember that and appreciate that a lot more than if you just talked about yourself. And I'll tell you, I learned this the hard way. I'll tell you the truth. I learned it the hard way. Because I, used to, I started traveling when I was you know, in my like, early to mid-20s or early 20s. And back then, there weren't a lot of young people traveling. And I was going all over the country. And sometimes every single weekend, I'm in another state. I honestly don't know if I've ever been to Missouri before this or not because I lost track. I've been to a lot of places and I didn't keep a journal. So, so I'd get in a car and people would be kind of amazed that this guy is early 20s and they start asking me a lot of things. Are you married and how did you meet your wife and, and all that. So I got used to people being interested in me. So I got used to just talking and, and talking about myself because I thought, well, that's what happens every time I travel somewhere. And then two things happened. One was one day my wife was with me on a trip. And she was like, when we got out, she's like, what is the matter with you? All you did was talk about yourself nonstop. Who do you think you are? And you know, she just let me have it. That was the first experience. Second experience was I was with this, uh, I was at a conference in the UK. As a side note, never go to the UK. Okay, and, and they said, okay, they're going to take you and Sheikh so-and-so out. Uh, some volunteers are going to take you and this other speaker from the conference out for dinner. And I'd never, I, I, I didn't know that speaker, so I didn't know him at all, and he didn't know me either. So he thought I was just one of his fanboys, all right? And we all went to dinner, and I got to see myself in him. He was just talking about himself nonstop. Just non-stop. And I was like, oh man, oh man. That's what I was like, huh? And then, but he wants to show that he's gracious. So then, after all this talking, he stops for a minute and turns around and looks at me. He said, what's your name, brother? Because he wants to show that I'm like the Prophet uh, and I give everybody some kind of attention. And he, but when you give people attention, give them genuine attention. Don't throw generic nonsense at people because people are not dumb. They catch that stuff. He turns, he goes, what's your name? I said, my name's Kamat. I said, nice to meet you, brother. Then he looks at me, he goes, uh, seek Islamic knowledge, brother. I'm not above that advice. I'm not like, oh, I'm a sheikh. No, no, I'm not above that advice. I appreciate that. You tell me to seek. I should seek more knowledge. Okay, I'm not above the advice. I just didn't like that it was so disingenuous, and that you're just throwing some generic nonsense at me, like, oh, okay, seek knowledge, but yeah, you can talk about yourself for 10, <laughs> 30 straight minutes, and then you just tell me in terms like, seek, seek knowledge, and I do care about you, I care about your well-being. Don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> so disingenuous. All right, how much time do I have? Let me wrap up with my good points here. Now, khalas, we're done? Five minutes? Okay, good, good. Um, so, make, don't make people feel small. And don't listen to anyone who makes you feel small. I always tell the youth that. You listen to this guy who, whether you feel it directly or not, he is trying to make you feel unworthy, that you're nothing in comparison to him. Anyone who flashes their success or whatever in your face or talks about how great they are, why would you listen to someone like that? And you guys know who I'm talking about. Okay? 
And that's also one of the things I hate about rap music, okay? Besides the fact that it's pure garbage, put that aside. But it's this guy who's in his 20s, he's 23 or 24, doesn't know anything. He's misguided. He doesn't know anything about the real word. He just knows about the streets and busting a cap with somebody and whatever, okay? And then he is going, you're going to be listening to an entire album of this guy telling you how great he is. I don't understand listening to rap. I've got so much money, gold in my ring, bling in my teeth. My, what is this? What is this? Okay, what if you just take the beat away, and just write these lyrics, put them in a book, give them to someone. Like, okay, I've got gold in my, I've got gold on my neck, I've got bling in my teeth. Okay, I have so much money that the bank can't hold it. I've got guns in my. What is this nonsense? It's garbage. And never listen to anybody who makes you feel like you don't have anything, because. That goes against you respecting yourself when someone's condescending. There's a speaker in the Arabic language. He's a deviant, okay, so he's not like a scholar or anything. He's a very deviant speaker, but he got very popular. And people who listen to him, I always wonder, like, I would love to do a study on his audience. I guarantee you, they're all people with low self-esteem. Because the way he speaks to people, his expression always says, and excuse my language, you're all fools, you're complete imbeciles, and let me tell you something. The expression on his face says that. He's always doing this. And he does this to people. What is that? How could you listen to someone like that? But you know, you know something? Self-esteem is your, your self-worth. It's how you value yourself. And people who allow people to you know, speak to them in a condescending manner, they typically have low self-esteem. And people who won't sit for that kind of nonsense have high self-esteem. I'll give you something from the Quran. Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what did he do? He belittled his people, they respected him. Some people are like that. You speak to them in a rude way, condescending, oh, he must be important. And they start to lower themselves, right? And they obey. And some other people, they have high self-esteem. If you speak to them that way, they would never sit around you. And that's how the companions were. They have self they had self-respect, and that's evidence in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا قَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ This is proof that they have high self-esteem. If you were harsh-hearted, if you were crude with them, they would scatter from around you. It doesn't matter what your message is, but if you don't present and package that message nicely, they're not going to sit and listen to it. They're not going to be insulted. Fir'aun's people, a lot of them were in bondage, they were enslaved, in, enslaved, and so they would allow for that. The companions wouldn't allow for that. They had high self-esteem. Never listen to anyone who makes you feel lesser about yourself or shows you cars or mansions or so, shows you watches or talks about their money and their success and try to make you feel small. Even if they're not trying to do that, don't listen to anything or watch anything that will make you feel that you have less materialistically or knowledge-wise or anything. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end here. But I would like to recommend that book. I would now, why am I recommending that book before the seerah? That book will unlock the keys to understanding how to deal with people, how to behave with people. And then you go read the seerah, and you're going to find all, the, all these techniques applied practically. And then it'll open your eyes to, to every other hadith you read. You'll start to see, oh, here, this is a teaching technique. Or here's a, a, a technique. This proves emotional intelligence. But the main point I want you to take away is that everybody in the room already has that ability. All you have to do is bring it up a notch. All you have to do is bring it up a notch. And don't make any excuses for yourself. Oh, I'm not good with names. Of course you're good with names. I guarantee you most people in this room speak two languages. Some speak three, some, some probably speak four languages. And that's thousands and thousands of words that you've memorized. You can't remember that this guy's name is Ali? Of course you can. And there are techniques. There's no excuse in this day and age. Show me, so many videos teaching you how to memorize, how to remember people's names, how to learn a language quickly. All these things, use them to your advantage. For that, Zakim al Khairan for number one, being an attentive audience. Number two, Zakim al Khairan for coming early to the first lecture. 
and I'll see you in the next ones. We have Allah sallallahu alaihi wa Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Kamal. Inshallah, we'll have a 10 minute break. We have Panera and the grind and refreshments over there in the snack room. Feel free to have some and we'll continue in 10 minutes, inshallah.